and I see um, Alida has joined. She's 316. So the, the, the person who's 316 is Alida, but she, I think she might be at work. So she'll be having the sound down. <laughs> Hi. Hi, how are you guys? Very good. Very good. At work. Hi, that's fine. That's fine. But Thank if you. you want to ask questions, Alida, and not speak, you can always just use the chat. Okay, thank you. So that's good. Um, so I'll put I'll put um, the gallery view so I can see everybody's face. Yeah, I can see everybody now. Now, um, if I speak too fast for anybody, you will just slow me down, right? So use the wee reaction thing to say like that, say, hey, slow down a little bit, yep. Uh, so do that, remember to lower your hand after you do that, right, because otherwise I'm, I'm gonna give you attention. Um, do just tell me if I go too fast, because this is for your benefit. And it's no benefit whatsoever if I go too fast and you don't get what I'm saying. So I will slow down so that everyone is getting what we're saying, okay? Um, so it's lovely to see some new faces and some old faces. Um, um, we have some regulars that sort of attend on a regular basis, um, but it's always good to get um, new people as well. So what we do is we essentially do one class like this a week, or we do it at two different time zones. So I've got this one, which is 4 p.m. UK time. And then I do another one later at 11 p.m. So when Jing, I'll, I'll be working at 11, just like you are now, later. Uh, <laughs> and that's for the benefit of those in the Americas. So we've got, um, as well as Alida, there are others from her country, which is Colombia and also from Guatemala. Um, and there's quite a few in that region, although they don't always join the online class. It's normally a bit of a smaller class and they're all Spanish speakers. Plus I have Alice. Alice joined that last week and I think we'll be joining it moving forward. Um, and it's, she gets up very early in the morning to do that. So I'm sure she would be pleased to meet you, Wen Jing, at some point. I will figure out a way of introducing you guys. Um, I have thought, and I want you all to speak up on this point, that if this time isn't good for you guys, I could do another class. So Afsani's mentioned to me that the time is not always ideal for her. And it's obviously very late for you, Wee-Son, and Wen Jing. So, um, you know, we could always look at doing another time that might work for you you folks that are very, very far east. Um, we had one lady on last week from Thailand. So that would be a similar time zone to you guys. So we'll, we'll see, play a bit here, but I'm happy to adjust, find times, different days if necessary, so that we can all um, speak. Now, I don't want to do all the talking because it's important that you guys get practice at talking. So, um, don't worry about being slow. Um, I made a few suggestions on the forum about things that we could do. And I want you to tell me what you'd like me to focus on. So we could do some grammar together. We could do some vocabulary, both going over the stuff that we did online in, in the group, but maybe just confirming some stuff and confirming pronunciation. We could do some of that. We could do some expressions and we can also do role play. Um, or I can also just try and answer any questions if anyone has any. So what are people preferences? Why don't we get some of you to speak up and say, this is what I quite fancy doing today. And that's good practice for you all. So um, I'll go to somebody who is, um, I know comfortable speaking, and then the rest can also chip in afterwards if you would like to do that. By the way, that expression chip in, we say that a lot, to chip in. So if you're having a conversation and there's more than two of you, if there's three or more, um, 
if somebody wants to speak and sort of butt in to the conversation, we, we use that expression, chip in, chip in. We, how do you spell? How do you spell it? So that's a good question, Wenjing. Let me write it down. So yeah. I'll do that. Chip in, two words, chip in. Oh. So, um, so for example, use it like this. So when Jing was chatting to Wee San, but um, let's say about Everest, but I chipped in that I would never attempt that. See that? When Jing was trying to move her boat, but I tripped in. Yeah, I saw that. See? So, so we say the chip in. So I'll maybe get <laughs> Anjali, since she is um, one of the um, members of the group with the longest tenure, one of the longest tenures, to maybe just share some thoughts, Anjali, on what you might like to do today. Uh, so, I think it would be better if we can practice some of the vocabulary that we have, that we did last Yep. Okay, no problemo. So that's a vote for uh, going over some of the vocabulary. Um, what about um, Elham? What, 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 what thoughts do you have, my dear? Um, uh... It's just for me, uh, the role play session was really useful. Okay. Uh, I learned a lot, uh, both from culture for culture and uh, the sentences. Yeah. Uh, okay. Also, when you speak yourself, like your uh, soliloquies, yeah. I really uh, um, uh, enjoy that. It is very helpful for me. Okay. And. Uh, uh, when we had a guest, that session also was very good. Yeah. Uh, everybody had to speak and it was very useful too. Yeah, okay, cool. Thank you. So for Wen Jing's benefit, the, the guest last week was Udita. <laughs> I asked really? Her, hi, I asked her to join and talk about her experiences. So Wen Jing worked for Udita, who worked for me. Um, so... Um, uh, she knows editor really well so there you go uh, yeah so i asked her on as a special guest last week and my thinking is maybe maybe once a month something like that i'll have a special guest on who will talk about their life what they're doing they may they may have a special interest in la language like udita does and is a real expert in english um but they may not, they may just be, you know, I could get a doctor, I could get an architect, I could get different people. I'm thinking males, females, old and young, different walks of life that you can interact with. Um, I also know lots of people with different accents. So I speak with an Irish accent, um, but I can bring people <laughs> with a Scottish accent. I can bring people with an English accent. There's many accents in England. Um, Welsh, I know a few Welsh boys um, and they speak, they sing along. They they say, "Oh, I can just see Cantalan on a tractor." They sort of very up and yeah. down like that. It's very, very unusual to my ear, anyway. But it's nice. Um, so I'll let you hear some different native accents as well, and you can just ask questions of people, and then that's an experience for you, asking and interacting with others, and that means you don't have to listen to my dulcet tones all the time. Okay, so that's a few ideas, vocabulary, role play, and soliloquies, you can do that, no problem. Um, so let me bring up my notes um, of the words that we did in the last week, um, which I have prepared earlier. And the first of those was unequivocal, unequivocal, right? And what I'll do is rather than have it take over the screen, which I can do as well. Um, I can just write it into the, uh, the box. There you go, unequivocal. That was the first word, unequivocal. And the opposite of unequivocal is, 
is to equivocate, to equivocate. Right. So, um, first of all, do, do folks remember what unequivocal meant? People remember? Clear or explicit, vivid. Yeah, clear or explicit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, um, so it's it's when something there is no room for doubt whatsoever. Um, and 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 so the opposite is to equivocate is to is to waver. So. Um, we we son said to me, I'm making this up, this is not real, but he said to me, Alan, you should think about climbing Everest too. <laughs> but I equivocated. See, I wavered. I wasn't too sure. But if I was a if I was a braver sort, I might I might give him a clear and unequivocal answer. Yes, absolutely, I will. So that's me using the two versions of that word, the two sides of the coin. The two sides of the coin is an expression we use in English a lot, the two sides of the coin. So if there's any issue and, and you've got you know, the plus and the minus, um, we, we, we say the other side of the coin. I just said that without thinking about it there and realized, I don't know if you know that. So, so we would say, the other side of the coin is blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm just going to, I'll be right back. Okay. Roll, rolls. I just had to put my pump off because the shower pump, if anybody uses any water in the house, it sort of comes on and I find it really irritating. So I can't cope with that kind of thing. So, right. So is that clear? Anybody got? Yeah, it's clear. Yeah. yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you see, Elham's giving, me, El Elham's giving me a thumbs up. You see that? So that's that. You've got a question, Angela. Go ahead. Uh, okay. You said that the opposite of unequivocal is like equivocate, right? And equivocate, yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So um, is there any word like equivocal? You added like A T E. Why is that? Like generally the the opposite of happy is unhappy. Yeah. But there is this Equivocate, right? Yeah, I've just written it on the in the chat. You see that? You see what I've written in the chat? Equivocate. Yeah. Yeah, but Perfect. it's the opposite of but it's the opposite of unequivocal. Yeah, is equivocate. And and yeah, we, we would say an unequivocal answer. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it, it's not, uh, I, I, know, I know it doesn't sound kind of right because it's not exactly the same. I'd have to look it up. In the, I'd have to look it up in the dictionary to be honest with you. What people say is unequivocal and they say equivocate as the opposite. But we say unequivocal, unequivocal far more like frequently. It, it's okay. when you say, when you when you want to say something is un, unequivocal says it's 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 there's no doubt it's saying that there's no doubt and we quite often say clear and unequivocal and clear means it's well understood what I meant there's no doubt about what I meant and and it's firm is what un, 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 unequivocal is saying by the way. When you say a word twice, uh, two words with the same meaning twice, um, that's called a tautology. Tautology. You're repeating yourself using a different word. 
Um, Oh, can you give some example about this? Yeah. Yeah. What I'll do is I'll actually look it up and get an example of tautology. I'll get a better one. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he, one example is um, uh, it was adequate enough. So to say it was adequate is perfectly clear. Mm -hmm. Say it was enough it really means the same thing, but you're saying the same thing over. You see that? Yeah. Uh, I'll give you some more examples. Um, uh, I went to see him personally. Well, obviously you went to see him personally. Yeah. Does everybody see that? Because obviously, if you see somebody, you're you're seeing them. It's a personal mm -hmm. meeting. It's two people. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Mona. Hi, Mona. You've just joined it. Hi, Mona. Hi, teacher. Hi, how are you Hi, doing? Hi, teacher. Hi, yeah. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, Hi. Hi Mona. We've got a few new people on. We've got uh, Wei Son from China. Shanghai and also Wen Jing from China and we also have Afsani uh, she's on the top left of my screen but it might be a different position to yours and she's from um, Iran as well Mona so Mona's from Iran uh, as is Elham so you've got you've got a few compatriots uh, Afsani am I pronouncing your name correct Afsani I'm saying Afsani is that the right pronunciation uh, no, Afsane. Afsane. Ne, Afsane. 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 Right, you correct me if I get it wrong. I like, you, I like getting you, people name right. You can uh, say Afsan. 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 Yeah. Okay. I want to do it right. Uh, Afsane. Afsane. In Persian, it means that a uh, long story. Long story. Yes. Okay. All right. So there you go. <laughs> right. So, so, so I think we've done that word to death. As a wee expression, we've done that word to death. It doesn't mean we killed it. Well, we didn't stab it, but we're, we're tired of it now. So does everybody understand what clear and, and unequivocal means and what a tautology is? Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Right. So let's look up the next word then that we did um, was conviction. Um, now, uh, so this is a legal word in a sense. So Mona will like that since she's a legal expert. Um, we speak about when somebody has had a conviction, it means that after they are accused of a crime, if I'm accused of a crime, um, that's okay, because according to the courts, I am innocent until proven guilty. Now that's another expression, by the way, that we, we, we say a lot here. Innocent until proven guilty. So just because yeah, somebody's- I think that will be good so you see that it's in it's in the chat, innocent until proven oh, yeah. guilty. So that's a principle we have in this country. Now other countries might be different. If somebody accuses you of a crime, maybe they think you're guilty. Yeah. Um, no, but in India we have this case. Like you have that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's obviously just because somebody points a finger at you doesn't mean you did a crime, right? Um, so if somebody said uh, he murdered somebody, that's a really serious crime you know, they better be right. And they can't lock me up until, you know, they can prove it. And that means you need a witness or multiple witnesses or some form of evidence, right? Now, um, but if I am taken to court and I am convicted, if I'm, and I have a conviction against me, then Basically, that says the court has found me guilty. 
and that becomes a black mark on my record that would affect me for the rest of my life. So it would mean that one, I would go to prison, possibly, probably, or have to pay a fine, depending on what the crime was. And, and then even when I come out of prison, I might struggle to find employment because lots of employers will not employ somebody who has any convictions against their name other than parking fines, which we don't care about. Mm-hmm. And we don't really care about driving offences like you know speeding and things like that. But anything to do with robbery or murder or you know grievous bodily harm, <laughs> anything like that, you know, you would really struggle to find employment. Um, so, so that's what having a conviction is in a legal sense. But quite a few of you, when you're answering the homework, also picked up the other reason, the other meaning of the word, which is the meaning that says, I have a deep-seated hell belief in something. Now, that might be a deep-seated belief about a, an event, um, or it could be like a philosophical thing or a religious thing. So, um, um, you know, I could say I've got a real conviction. I'm just using this as an example. I've got a real conviction that learning another language will be of benefit to me. I've got a real conviction about it, that it's a good idea. Right? Now, that basically says it's deep in my being that it's not like i believe it maybe it's i i it's going to affect me and my behavior that is what i'm saying so i have a conviction about that um i might have a conviction that um alcohol is so dangerous that you shouldn't touch it and you should be teetotal right that's why i could have a conviction about that And it means I won't touch it. I won't, you know, see. But the converse is I might not have a conviction about that. And I might say it's okay as long as you don't go to excess and you don't get drunk and and behave badly as a result of being drunk, right? So I might take that point of view. Um but whatever point of view I end up coming to, I could have a conviction about that. But you would normally have a conviction about something strong, you know, really hell. So, for example, I, I might have a conviction that women should be treated the same as men, you know, say, for example, uh, and have a deep seated hell belief about that. And I would describe that as a conviction. Yeah, I've got a conviction that that's the right thing. Mm-hmm. Or um, to use other language that's very common, uh, you know, that uh, all men are created equal, right? The, the, that, um, that statement that comes from the American Constitution, all men doesn't mean just males, it means men and women. Um, all men are created equal is a very strong statement. Um, and lots of people will have a conviction about that, say. Right, but but others mightn't. Others mightn't agree with that. Right, so um, people might have a conviction that eating meat um, is a bad idea, and that we should all be vegetarians. Right, and you would describe that as a conviction. A bit of a conviction about that issue or that 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 point of view. So that's what a conviction is, or the the, the two sides. We've dealt with the two sides of that coin, right? They're just shades of meaning. There's the legal sense, and there is the um, the sort of belief, um, philosophical sense. Now, before we move on, is there anybody got any questions on that? Yeah. Ooh. Hi, go ahead, Wenjing. Yeah, you, you mentioned the belief. So what is the difference between conviction and the belief? Because normally belief is more simple. So uh, it's uh, likely for me, I will use belief more frequent. Um, 
Um, okay, so first of all, that's a good question. And I'll repeat the question so that it confirms I understood the question. And if I didn't, you can correct me. Um, what Wen Jing is saying is, what's the difference between a belief and conviction? Um, mm -hmm. And she's saying that a belief is more simple. Um, so, good question. Let me just ruminate, right? Ruminate's a good word. Ruminate. Do you know that word? Bet you don't. Ruminate. I'm going to ruminate. And to ruminate is to think out loud. And I do a lot of that. I do lots of thinking out loud, right? Um, which is an extrovert thing, by the way. Extroverts do that. They, they sort of talk and they're expecting a reaction. Um, introverts tend to think ahead of time and then speak. <laughs> which is a good approach, by the way, in life. But sometimes extroverts tend to have not fully formed thoughts and they just speak. So a belief could be... Um, beliefs can vary from something innocuous. Do you know what innocuous means? We have done it and I have explained it before. Innocuous means harmless, totally harmless. Okay. So I could have a belief, it's a lovely sunny day here in Scotland, but I could have a belief it's going to rain tomorrow. Now that's a very innocuous thing. It's not, it's not an important thing. And I couldn't know with any accuracy if I'm right or not, but I could say maybe the forecast tells me that. So I have a belief it's going to rain tomorrow. Right? Now, so it can be, um, I could say, I, I have a, I believe Alison is making lamb and couscous Middle Eastern thing for dinner tonight. I believe that, right? So again, it's a totally harmless, innocuous thing. So you can use that word like that. You'd never say conviction about such things as that, never. But belief is, a, is on a spectrum and it can be from the very simple and innocuous through to deeply held things like, you know, what you know um you know what i believe religiously for example that would be deep beliefs so people talk about that and they speak about that um they also use the word faith right faith and belief is the same word essentially right so i have faith in something or faith that something will be done is the same as saying i believe it that's the same word right so um you know, so I could, I could have strongly held religious views as well. Um, and that would be described as a belief. You could have views that are not religious, that would be the opposite of that. So you describe somebody who has um, an atheistic outlook on life. Atheist means A is, is no, is the opposite. Theist is, is God. So an atheist doesn't believe in God, right? Now, an atheist can often have great conviction about that. They'll have a strongly held belief about that. And they would mm. argue it very strongly, right? Now, that's, that's a point of view. It's not one I agree with, but, but many people would describe themselves freely as an atheist. And there's other people who believe in God, right? which would be the opposite of that. And then you could have people in between those two things. And, 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 and this, is a, this is a generalization, but to be in between those two things would be described, if you use the Greek word, it's agnostic. Agnostic. A is again means opposite, and gnostic means to know, right? So gnosis, and gnosis, begins with G, it's a silent G in Greek. So agnostic is somebody who fundamentally believes that you don't know, you can't know about those kind of things, right?
that that's outside our sphere. You can't know God and you can't, you can't know that he exists and you can't know that he doesn't exist. That's what, that's the position of, um, of an agnostic. Uh, a, A little bit of fun I'll have with you is to say that the same word in Latin is ignoramus. Right. <laughs> um, and you're not laughing because you probably haven't heard that word before, but an ignoramus um, is a word that we use in English a lot. Uh, and it means that somebody is ignorant. They're stupid. Right. They're mm-hmm. stupid. That's what an ignoramus is. Somebody who's just completely dense. Right. None of you are ignoramuses because you wouldn't be on this class otherwise. Right. But to be described as an ignoramus would be very pejorative, very, you know, that'd be very, you know, you, you mean, you know, you, you wouldn't describe somebody as an ignoramus to their face, <laughs> typically, yeah. unless you want to slap, right? So, but that's the same word. It's actually the same word, right? It means you don't know, you don't know. Um, okay, so, so belief can be from the simple, the innocuous things that don't matter through to things that are really, really important to people, right? Deeply, deeply held beliefs. Now, a deeply held belief, things at that end of the spectrum could be described as a conviction. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Only, only things that you have deeply held beliefs about. So if we change, if we switch gears, switch gears is another term, right? I'm going to switch gears here. I'll come back to that expression in a moment, what it means. I'm going to switch gears and talk about politics for a moment, right? Um, So we talked about religion a little bit. And if we talk about politics briefly, I could, I could have a deep held conviction that democracy is the way governance should be. The country should be governed and that people have a voice. I could have a conviction about that, but I might not. I, I could be a follower of Marx, uh, M-A-R-X, um, and who was the first guy that ended up th- coming up with a communist um, sort of way of managing a society. And I could have a conviction that that's the right way. I could have a conviction about that. So I'm not saying that is right or wrong. I'm not passing judgment on that. We could talk about that if you want, but it, it might get a bit tense, so I'll, I'll avoid that. Um, but you see, people have convictions about these things. See, a conviction about it. They could, you could have a belief about it and you could have a conviction about it. Okay, now I said on the way through there, I switched gears and obviously that comes from, it's an analogy, analogy. And lots of things in English are analogies. And so when you're driving a car, you you change gears, right? First to second, third, fourth. Older cars, you change the gears manually. More modern cars have automatic transmissions. Now, so when I change gear, I'm, I'm changing from one thing to another. And so we just borrow that analogy and bring it into conversation and topics and say, I'm gonna switch gears now. And it means, right, I'm going to change, right? I'm going to change from talking about one thing to, to the next thing. Yeah. It's just a polite way of saying I'm going to change topics. So if I just maybe sound out, say, Anjali, since you speak English quite a bit in India, in India, would you have heard that expression before? I'm going to switch gears. Would you have heard that? Or is that new to you? Uh, no, but I understood that. You understood it. Yeah, you understood it. Yeah. So you can often figure out what a word or an expression means just by how I use it. Eh? And that's, that's how most people pick up most things. Most people go, don't get taught expressions. They just figured out how it's being used. Yeah. And, and we have dealt with many, many expressions in the five or six weeks that this group has been going. Right. I mean, there's, there's, Lots of them, and and native speakers use the expressions like without thinking about it. It's just it's just how we express ourselves, right? Um, so he is as useless as a chocolate teapot. There, here's a good one. <laughs> so to describe somebody as useless as a chocolate teapot is a very 
disparaging comment, right? So I've got my tea here. Uh, right, There's my hot chocolate cup, you see? But it's actually got coffee in it. But you couldn't make a teapot out of chocolate, right? Because if you put the hot water in it, it would melt, right? So I, I have heard people being described as he is as useful as a chocolate teapot, <laughs> right? Which is obviously saying they're hopeless, they're useless, right? So you wouldn't want it to be described like that, but that's just an expression. Let me write it down. So it goes in the, in, in the record, right? So if we were in court, it would have to get written down. So don't let me say anything that's new to you that I don't actually record. So um, as useful as a chocolate teapot. Now, obviously you could say as useless as a chocolate teapot, but people say the opposite way. They say it's as useful as if it is useful as a chocolate teapot, knowing that the person will understand that they don't mean that they mean the opposite you get me does that make sense mm, actually yeah. i'm not getting it so yeah I'm okay that's fine well i'll make sure i'll i'll i'll, I'll take our time here afsani wants to ask a question um you say ignoramus yes it means uh, the um, it's an adjective uh, Ignoramus. Ignoramus, yeah. Ignoramus, yeah. Um, Just the, the, the foundation of ignoramus is um, ignore. No, but that's a good, brilliant question. But uh, they probably come from the same root. I'm sure they do. But ignoramus, ignoramus means at root, don't know. And it's the same as agnostic. Mm -hmm. um, um, ignoramus is a Latin word. And agnostic is a Greek word. Okay? But, but the, the meaning, the root meaning is the same. But when we translate these things into English, essentially, if we describe somebody as an ignoramus, we are telling you that they're stupid. So today, ignoramus in English means someone is an idiot, right? Stupid. That's what we mean. And today, if we say somebody is a agnostic, is a religious, it's, it's not always religious, but I'll, I'll use that definition first because that's the most, how often it's used. It means in a religious sense, someone neither believes in God or doesn't believe in God. They have no conviction to bring that word back in. Now, um, take time to read what I've said and make sure that what I've just said makes sense to you guys before we go further. Does that make sense? Um, igno um, um, ignoramus um, is not just for um, conviction or uh, belief men, religious conviction. Uh, for example, uh, we can say um, he's so ignoramus about um, uh, healthy problems. It's true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So for example, you could say um, he he does not understand that um, what you eat affects your health, right? Mm -hmm. As a preface statement, and then you could follow it up with your statement, Asani, and say that. Um, he is a total ignoramus mm -hmm. when it comes to diet. Yes, thanks. Yeah, makes sense. So, so, so to be described as an ignoramus in any area is a bad thing. 
Now, now I often explain the nuances of words. I'll just write that word nuance, which is where a word has shades of meaning. And coming back to agnostic, the main use of that word, by far and away, 90% of the usage would be in the way that I've described it. Somebody who has no strong religious convictions, right? However, you could say about other issues that they are agnostic. So, Alan, so let's, let's ask, ask a hypothetical rhetorical question, right? So, um, um, do you think that playing classical music to children makes them more intelligent? Right. There's a question. Now, some people believe that, and, and they'll actually play Beethoven to their children <laughs> and their babies. And there's even some people will play the music when they've got the baby in their tummy because <laughs> they think their kids will turn out more intelligent. Right. This is true. This is a true statement. Whether you think it's absolute nonsense or there's something might be in it, is, uh, you, can, you can let me know. Right. So, but somebody could say, Alan, have you heard that? I would say, yeah, I have actually heard that. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Do you think that's true? I could say I'm agnostic in that. And what I would be saying about that is I have no strong convictions on it. I don't know. I, I just don't know. I'm ignorant of it. I don't know. I have no idea. It may be true. It might not be true. I don't know. That's one way of answering that question. I could convey the same sentiment by also saying this. I'm ambivalent. Let me write that down. Ambivalent. So ambivalent means it's particularly when you have to make a choice in something. Are you going to do this or are you going to do that? Um, I'm ambivalent. So what's your favorite country, Alan? Uh, China or India? There's a good there's a good question for this audience. Wh- what's your favorite country? Is it China or is it India? <laughs> Right now, that's a legitimate question. Now I could answer that and say, I'm ambivalent, right? Which means I have no, I don't mind, I don't know, right? I will say that I'm probably biased because I have been to India five times in my life. And I really love it. I like the people, I like the food, I like the weather, I like lots of things about India. I have never been to China. However, now I come to my qualification statement. I really want to go to see, the China, see China. I want to. I want to see my friends in China, Wen Jing and now Wei Son. <laughs> yeah, I want to see the Great Wall of China. I want to see the Sleeping Warriors. Is it the Sleeping Warriors? Um, you know, I would like to see Peking. I would like to see Shanghai. There's lots of things I'd like to see in China. So I have a strong desire to do that. So getting back to your key question, what's your favorite country? I don't have a preference at this stage because with respect to China, I am actually quite ignorant. Now in saying I'm ignorant doesn't say I'm stupid. It just says I don't have knowledge about it. I I don't have experiential knowledge. That's a really good expression, right? Um, I don't have experiential knowledge. You see, you can have knowledge through reading a book or looking at reading Wikipedia, but I have no experiential knowledge. I have no experience. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a woman and she's suddenly gone into labor in the street. Alan, can you help? I've read a book on how to deliver a baby. Well, that would be really helpful. (laughs) Here's somebody else and they're a midwife and they have you know, 10 years experience in delivering babies, maybe they would do a better job? Absolutely. Because they have experiential knowledge. Make sense? So we've dealt with agnostic, we've dealt with ignoramus, we've dealt with being as useful as a chocolate. Now, did somebody have a question about that? As useful as a chocolate teapot. Uh, no, sir, I, I got it. I you got it now. Totally okay, good. 
Hi, Andres. I see you've joined the team. How are you doing? Hi, everyone. Hi. Nice to see you. Thanks Thank for you. All, thanks for all your contributions in the group. Been very good. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so what we're doing, Andreas, you missed the start. Um, we're just going over the words that we've already done, um, you know, in the group, but just expanding on the definitions and making sure everybody's clear on them. We're just working our way through that. And then we're going to do some role play. And Elham wanted me to do some soliloquies, but I'm doing lots of talking anyway, so. But I do want to give you guys an opportunity to speak because that's when you really know you're getting your head around language is when you can speak it. So uh, Andreas, I said to the others, slow me down if I'm speaking too fast for you. Just say, Alan, I'm not getting it. Slow down, slow down, slow down. Okay? Okay, okay. Don't be embarrassed about that. Uh, everyone at, uh, oh my man. Okay, uh, let me tell you a little about my life. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, who I am. <laughs> okay, I'm so excited to be here with you. I'll, I you, I will try it. Uh, to do my best. That's great. Uh, I'm Felipe. I'm from Colombia. I was uh, I was born in the in the city of Manizales. Right. Uh, on July twenty first, uh, nineteen eighty two. Eighty uh, two. I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel nervous. <laughs> That's fine. This is fine. <laughs> Don't worry, you don't need to give us your whole life story, but it's great to okay. uh, it's great to meet you. It's great to have you on the team. We have a few Colombians. Um, 316 there is Alida. She's actually at work, so she's got her camera off, but she's also Colombian. Okay, um, thank you. And, and we also have um, uh, e Eo. She, her, 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 um, I think her real name is Ingrid, but... She goes by EO on the, I don't know if it's her nickname or, but that, that's it, that's her handle on, on this, right? Her handle is EO. You, you'll see her participating. Um, and both Alida and EO join the Western class, which is at 11 p.m. my time, which is about 5 p.m. your time, which is really designed for those in that kind of geography. So uh, if you can make this class, you can also make the other class if you want. It's up to yourself if you're. As, as we would say, if you are a, anybody know what I'm going to say? I, I said, uh, if, you're yeah. glutton, if you're glutton for punishment. <laughs> so a glutton English is ladle. Like, what? English ladle. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. So that's just dealt with a few words there. So let's just let me go back to my list and see what's next. So we've done unequivocal, we've done conviction. We're making good progress, guys. We've done two words out of the list. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've only been going an hour. <laughs> I have for more. What was that, Andres? Continue. All right. So the next word was visage. Visage. This is a good okay. nice word. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. So this uh, was, okay. Um, I have, I have a uh, very happy, happily married for 17 years and have a wonderful uh, wife. That's I have two, I have two children, a 15 year old daughter and a nine year old son. And we are a very happy family. They are two sisters, uh, one brother. They are all younger uh, than me. Uh, my occupation or, or profession is a preacher or pastor. In the country, they call pastor. I am pastor with the grace of the Lord and uh, manage and 45 members, member 
congregation, any vigil. I have been working in pastor for a short time, only five years and two months. And in student basic, basic theology and the Baptist University of Cali, Colombia. And now they are teacher in the Bible Institute. I need, I teach New, New Testament and biblical geography for more, for more uh, than seven years. <laughs> Good. Uh, I am insisting. I like to teach to play instruments uh, such as acoustic guitar, electric guitar, wow, uh, piano, bass, and drums. Very I good. like. It. <laughs> uh, yes, that's good. It is really nice. So I think uh, Eo is also from Cali. You mentioned uh, Cali there. Um, Eo Eo is from Cali. I'm pretty sure. Yes. Yes. So, so Cali, so, Col Colombia, Cali, Cali, Colombia. Colombia. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. so thank you for that. That's really good. Um, and I'm glad you've joined the group. It's really good to have you. Okay, so I'm going, to go to, the, I'm going to go to the next word now. The next word is visage. Visage. Um, and um, since you're a preacher, man, you will know, you might know the expression, his visage was marred more than any man. You heard that? His visage was marred more than any man. Do you know that? Yes, Mr. Uh, yeah. Who's that describing? Yes. So that's an expression from Isaiah in the Old Testament about Christ. His visage was more marred than any man. So, it's a, so the, the word visage is basically your face. But it's not just your face, it's your face in terms of the expression that your face is conveying. So your visage could be one of joy, it could be one of sadness. Um, that's what your visage is, your visage. Um, to Elham's point that she often asks me to clarify is, how often is a word used? It wouldn't be an obscure word, but it would not also be used very frequently. Um, you know, there's different words we use to describe somebody's face, their complexion. Um, a, a, you would describe a woman's face as having a, a fair complexion, right? So that means she's got nice skin. That's your complexion. Um, or it could be opposite. It could be um, somebody's ha had acne in a teenager and they don't have a nice uh, complexion, okay? Um, you could also describe somebody's face because it often indicates the mood of a person. Um, and we would use the word their demeanor, their demeanor. Right? So we could say um, his demeanor was angry. So, so, so in other words, he was angry, but you could see it in his face. Or you could say his demeanor or her demeanor was fearful. Okay, so visage, visage would be more physical appearance of a face. The demeanor is your face. Emotion. Emotion. Excellent. Wenjing, brilliant. Exactly. <laughs> Thank exactly. you. Brilliant. Elham, you're on mute, Elham. Yes, um, Alan, I used to think that demeanor is uh, uh, defining your overall behavior. Yes. Now you're saying it is about the face. I'm saying, I'm sa really good question and a good challenge. And you're really right. <sighs> Thank but you. yeah, you're really right. But what I am saying is that your demeanor is 90% of it is determined by your, in your face. It's your demeanor. It's not, it's not just your behavior. It's. 
it, it's it's the look of your behavior almost, which is why I'm saying it's the face, right? So let's go to the dictionary and see what the dictionary says, right? Let's 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 look this up, right? So meaning, um, meaning of demeanor. Uh, and let me share the screen so we can all read this together. Share screen. Go. Here we go. Right, demeanor. Outward behavior or bearing is happy demeanor. Right, let's look at the next definition. Um, Cambridge. A way of looking and behaving. So you see that behaving, it was your point and mine was the looking point. You see that? And what I'm trying to say is it's both these things. It, this is one of those words that has shades of meaning. There was nothing in his demeanor that suggested he was anxious. You couldn't tell by looking at him. She has the demeanor of a woman who is contented with her life. So you can tell. So that last statement is about how she looks. It's not got to do with her behavior. It's about how she is coming over as you're listening to her speaking or her, you, you see? So, uh, so if, uh, if I tell you I like your demeanor, it means uh, I like both your uh, behavior and your body language and everything you show me. Yes. We would never say that, though. We would never say, I like your demeanor. Oh. Never. Yeah. 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 Well, well, one, it's too direct a compliment, right? So, well, so Brits like us, we don't tell each other we like them directly. <laughs> <laughs> We're too shy to do that, right? We're too shy to do that, you know? Oh, you mean, uh, because I have heard the sentence, so you mean it is too rude to say something like that to anybody? We, we don't, so, so now this is nothing to do with English. This has got to do with um, British society and our etiquette. If we like somebody in the sense of friendly, we want to be friendly with them, want to be friends with them, if we like them, we would find ways to communicate that that are indirect. Right, we, but we wouldn't say it explicitly. We wouldn't say it. We would say it explicitly to another person. I really like her or I really like him. He's a, such a friendly guy. We would say it to somebody else, but we wouldn't say it to the person themselves. But we would say, we do things like this. We would say, do you want to go for a coffee? How about lunch tomorrow? Do you want to come over to my place and have dinner with my family? And it has the same meaning. And what, what I'm doing is I am, I am communicating the fact that I want to be your friend. And because I want to be your friend, I therefore like you. But I've done it indirectly. I didn't do it directly. I see. So if, if someone say that sentence to another person, it's kind of flirty? Yes, yes. And bad. Yes. In it, a bad way. It's so, it's, so, it's so direct. It's like completely off-putting. So, so for example, right, this is, a, this is a real example. Let me stop the share of the screen, right? So um, we all have this experience using this app, right? People come on and say, hi. All my Spanish friends say, hola, como estas, right? No, like somebody comes on to me and says, hi. And I say, hi back. And the next thing they say is, I like you. <laughs> What am I supposed to do with that, right? So I said, um, we don't say that to each other. I'm certainly not in the second sentence. You know, how can you like me? You don't know me. Are you basing that on my photograph? What do you mean you like me? You know, you realize this is not a dating app. This is an app for teaching language and learning language. You know, so she then said, I don't like you. <laughs> and I said, I don't know. I don't care. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that person has never joined my group, right? She, she missed out of being friends with all of you, right? Because it was far too direct. And uh, I, I was very direct in my answer back to her that, you know, you know, we don't do that. We don't say that. 
but we do form strong friendships, right? But we don't say it explicitly. And so the, the point that started this thread of discussion was you said, I like your demeanor. We would never say that to a person. We would say that about a person. I like El Elham's demeanor. She comes over to me as very, as having equanimity. She's calm. But I'm, I'm telling somebody else, I'm not telling you, right? That's if I wanted to tell you directly, I would write you a poem or something. I, you know, I wouldn't do it to your face. We wouldn't just, we did that. Now, and Americans would be the same as us. I don't know what it's like in other cultures, but I think this is the way it is. I see. Thank you. All right. A good culture point. <laughs> yeah. So, so the Wen Jing worked for me three months. She probably knows me better than anybody else on the call. But I would never have told her I liked her explicitly, but she would know I like her. <laughs> Yeah, you, you have uh, invited me to have a uh, dinner with your family. Yeah. As you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there you go. So, you know, you wouldn't do that to somebody if you really couldn't stand them, right? You wouldn't do that. So it's a way, it's a way of communicating that you like them. Yeah. So, right. So we've dealt with that point. Um, let me see what the next word was. The next word was corker. Now, lots of people answered this correctly in the questions. If something is a corker, it's really good, but it, it also could be something that's really embarrassing. So, you know, I, you know, I said something inappropriate. I was trying to, I'm trying to learn Spanish and I said something uh, and I described this girl and, and I used this word and I didn't realize it was an inappropriate term and it was a real corker. It was a real corker, right? In other words, it was like really embarrassing. So you can use it like that. And I would say we would typically use it like that. But in fact, we would use it more in that negative sense than in the positive sense, just saying something is a real corker, isn't it? It's very good. We would mostly use it in the embarrassing sense. You know, I made, to use an expression we, we, we've, we've done in the group, I made a faux pas. I made a faux pas. I made a mistake. I really screwed up there. So that's corker. Simple enough. No questions on that? Uh, there is this one term, sir, uh, like, uh, I cannot live down with that. We can also use that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's a great example. So it was such a corker, you know, I'll never live it down, right? I, I could tell you about an example of this in my life, but it's so embarrassing. I, I will never live it down and I don't even, even want to repeat it, right? Okay. <laughs> um, you know, and but the assumption I made about somebody and it was totally wrong. Um, I, 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 I will go red if I tell you what it is, <laughs> so I don't want to do it, <laughs> especially on something that's getting recorded. I would never, I would never live it down. So anyway, so yeah, so that's, that's what a corker is, right? So the next word was sensual, and that can be used on several things. Um, you, you could describe, you know, somebody's dress as sensual, right? You know? And so it, it has the sort of connotation of sexual, sexual, um, but not in an explicit sense. It's just saying that, you know, there, there's something sensual, you know, it, it could be in dress, it could be in, in what they say, and it could be in behavior. Um, you know, something is sensual. Uh, it would always be used to describe men or women's behavior. Yeah. And that behavior may or may not be appropriate, you know, in the context, right? So I don't want to say any more about that topic because it's a, it's a difficult 
topic to speak about in a public way. So I'll not go, any, go into that in any more detail. You can look that one up in the dictionary if you want to know more about all the colors and everything associated with that. Um, so the next word is in fact faux pas, right? Which is a French word. It's one of the many, many words that are French that have come into English. Let me write it down, faux pas. So that's the French pronunciation of that. Um, and it actually means a misstep. Um, and any, if I make a mistake at all, any mistake, I would say it was, it was a faux pas. You wouldn't typically say that about something that you did, although you could, but it's typically said about somebody else. You know, oh, they made a real faux pas, right? They didn't invite so-and-so to the wedding. That was a real faux pas. That was a mistake. If I made the mistake, I could do this. I could describe it as a mea culpa. And that's another language. What language does that come from? Anyone? Well. It's a Latin phrase. And mea culpa means my fault. Okay, so if, if I made a mistake, if I made the faux pas, if I do a mea culpa, and you read this word a lot in the press. So this is a very common expression. Mia culpa says, it's my fault. It's all my fault. I take the blame. I take the hit. I'm the scapegoat. We talked about scapegoat in the past. Another expression that comes from the Bible, scapegoat. So mia culpa, right? It's Can my fault. Die? Mia culpa equals my fault, blame me. And, and the kind of thing you read in the press is, um, the situation with the pandemic is really dire, um, but the prime minister will never declare mea culpa. So in other words, that's saying in a critical sense, he will not accept it's his fault. Can you please write it, sir? I'm not getting that. You want me to give another example, um, Angela? No, no, I'm, I, I want you to write that in the chat. Yeah, okay. the, the, I, did. The, I did. The sentence did the not show. You, you want oh, me to write no, the no. sentence? Is that what you're saying? No, no, I haven't got that thing. The last <laughs> word is cautious in the chat section. Oh, sorry, I am sending messages to Mona. Okay. See, so Mona asked me a question, can you explain more? And so I'm, I'm typing away and I'm, I'm typing to Mona as opposed to everybody. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, uh, everyone. You... So there, there you go, those are those words. So what, what was the question that you had, Mona, when you were saying, can you explain more? Was that about Corker? Uh, yes, Corker. Yeah, Corker. Unfortunately, I didn't understand the meaning of this in a positive meaning that you uh, told us. Okay, good. So let me look this up, right? So I'll look it up in the dictionary, first of all. Let's get the dictionary definition, Corker. Okay. And let me share the screen so we can all read it as well. Right, here we go, corker. A person or thing that is especially good, attractive or funny. So that's the, that, that is the, the standard positive definition. She told an absolute corker of a story about a priest she had mistaken for an ex-lover. <laughs> so a corker is something that is really good. Just think of it as anything that's really, really, really good. But um, uh, so this this is an interesting point. The corker, yeah, yeah. So let me um, turn Tucan off. Tucan changes the words in my web pages to Spanish um, to help me learn Spanish. This uh, so uh, a corker. You don't need to know this. This is this is arcane knowledge. But a corker is somebody um, 
on a ship that if you look at the surface of a ship that puts the bit in between, I'm pretty sure it's the bit that goes between the plywood, it's called, I think that's corking. It's, it's either that or the corker is the person who rivets, rivets the sides of the ship on. So that's a positive meaning, but it can be used in a, um, in another sense by saying that, um, like he told the real corker in an embarrassing sense, right? So like, I embarrassed myself by um, you know, using an I used an inappropriate word accidentally. That was a real corker. Okay, so um, Mona, does that make sense to you now? Yes, teacher. Thank you. Okay, right. So let's move on because I want to um, get through this list. So after Corker Essential and Faux Pas, the next word was gerund. And I think quite a few people got stuck on this word. So let me just write that word, the gerund. Now you'll notice, first of all, my pronunciation, gerund, as if I'm saying J-E-R-U-N-D, sounds like. So G, G in English is a confusing letter because sometimes it sounds like G, the gate, right? Um, the gate, right? It begins with G or gregarious or um, the name Gregory. So when G has that hard sound, that's the normal sign for G. But G also sometimes sounds like a J, J. And examples of that are the name George. We don't say Gorge, it's George. Um, Gerund is an example of that. Um, the Americans have a state called Georgia. Georgia. Um, gesticulate, right? I'm gesticulating. Someone who gesticulates is moving their hands around a lot. J. It, it, it sounds like a J, gesticulate. To genuflect is to bow down, right? If I genuflect, I, I write these words down. So gesticulate, move your arms around a lot. And genuflect is to bow down. Um, bow down as in the sense of worshipping somebody or serving somebody, um, you know, the, the servant genu genuflected, you know. Um, that's a really lovely word. It's a bit not super common. Educated people would know what it means. Press knows what it means. Joe Bloggs down the street doesn't know what it means. Genuflect, okay? So, ja. So, so a lot of words that begin with G begin with the J, just sound, yeah? Now, the gerund form, the word gerund is where you have a verb that is behaving as a noun. Um, and I used, I, I answered the question some people got it right, some people didn't get it right, and I just tried to fix the ones that were not right. Um, so like running, so I was out running at lunchtime. So I could say, somebody could ask me a question, how is your running coming along, Alan? Now, that is using the verb as a noun, how is your running? right, you're running, doing. 
uh, but somebody could see me running up the street and say, what's he doing? Oh, he's running up the street. Now that's a verb. I'm using run, the gerund form, but I'm using it as a verb. But if, if the verb becomes a noun because of its usage, then it's, we can describe it as a gerund. Now, this is a sort of subtle point. It's a point that most natives won't really get unless they've actually learned English, they won't even know this. I can remember the first book I read, the word gerund in it for the first time. And I, you know, I was reading um, T. E. Lawrence. He uses, he used, uh, that was where I read that word for the first time when I was a teenager. I can remember where I read words the first time. If I don't know the words, I thought, what does that word mean? And I had to go look it up. In those days, you had to look it up in the dictionary. It was very time consuming. But when I read that book, I, in past weeks on the forum, I've put pictures of that book up, um, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom uh, by T.E. Lawrence. Now, um, Andres will know where the expression The Seven Pillars of Wisdom comes from. It comes from the Proverbs in the Old Testament written by Solomon. Um, but T. Lawrence just used that as an interesting title for his book, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. But it's about the First World War and the behavior of the Brits in convincing the Arabs to fight the Turks in a guerrilla warfare. It was, it's a very interesting book. It's history. Um, but it is a difficult read unless you've got mastery of English because the language he uses is so, the right word is erudite. It's so, you know, he was an Oxford scholar uh, and it's an amazing book to read. And one day I recommend you all read that book, um, but it's too much for you just now. So that, it was in that book that I first read this word gerund. He talked about the gerund forms and I thought, I don't even know what he's talking about. I had to look it up. Okay, now, so if you don't get, from what I've said so far, if you're not getting gerund, don't worry about it. It's, you can come back to it. You know roughly what it is and you can read details online if you really want to understand it, all right? Um, let's just move on. Uh, chic is a good one and shabby chic, right? So let's just use that word. Uh, all right, did I write there, Jared? Yeah, I did. Right, chic and shabby chic. Now, chic is another word that comes from French, chic. We don't say chick, it looks like chick, right? But it's sheesh, S. Sheesh. Chic, chic, chic. So think, 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 think of the Arabs who dressed up with a white, right? We call, it, you know, we, we, talk, we describe them as sheiks, right? The sheik. Well, it sounds the same as that, but it's a different word. So um, sheik, let's, let's look up the dictionary together. Why don't we do that, right? Let's do that. Let's look up chic, see what it says. So it wants me to look it up in a different dictionary. Come on. Yeah, I, I, I can't find it on dictionary as well. Oh, I'm surprised. Um, did I spell it wrong a minute ago? I don't know. Um, so you can all you can you can spell it like this: C H I C. Mm. Stylish. I I would always spell it like C H I C K. Always. But I'm getting I voted here, I think, by um C 
fashionable and very elegant. The lady's pink silk scarf is very chic. Okay, so that's what chic is. This is a good word to know. Um, so back to Elham's point earlier about compliments, it is perfectly legitimate to compliment a woman's dress. So we don't so, say, I like you, but we say, I like your dress, Elham. That's very chic. That, that is totally yeah. acceptable. And, and in fact, good. Or a woman's hair, right? Oh yeah, I like your hair. Like Have you had your hair done? Th those, those are, that's regarded as very legitimate territory. And somebody once described it as, as to me, you, it's okay to describe things that man has done, not what God has done, right? Right, and that's a good way to think about it, right? So you never, you never compl compliment a woman on her body type, her body shape, right? You never do that, never, um, unless you're extremely intimate, right? And married or something like that, but and you'd never do that. But something man has made, the dress, the outward appearance, and the hair, their glasses, their earrings. I love your earrings, Wenjing. Those are really, really lovely. That's totally legit. Totally legit. And in fact, is regarded as um, good behavior. Like to know that first of all, you noticed. Secondly, you complimented. You're in that person's good books. They can't hate you after you say something like that. Okay. Now, now let's look up. Shabby chic. Shabby chic furniture. There you go. There, there's, there's a website called Shabby chic furniture. Shabby chic. Let's look it up on Wikipedia. It is a style of interior design and furniture furnishings either chosen for their appearance of age and words, blah, 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 stress, blah, 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 blah. So here you go. A dresser with a distressed finish and mismatched door, doorknobs is shabby chic style. So it's deliberately old looking and it probably mm. is old, right? That's described as shabby chic. No, right. But they're still missing something here, right? So um, dress is shabby chic. Right. And the term shabby chic mean, means dressing in a vintage inspired, often layered clothing that evokes a feminine feeling. The antithesis of modern fashion. Shabby chic clothing is pastel in color. It doesn't have to be pastel in color. That's just what they say, right? Right. So shabby chic clothing, shabby chic dress. Check out our shabby chic dress selection, blah, blah, blah. All right, let me stop the share. So that was the meaning I wanted you to understand. Shabby chic could be referred to furniture. It can also be referred to dress. If you dress in a shabby chic style, you're not being shabby, which is very horrible to describe as that. You would describe a tramp as shabby. You know, hey, Alan, you look really shabby. You haven't even shaved this morning, right? So that's, that's, that's very negative, very negative. But shabby chic is very complimentary because shabby chic is saying, you're sort of dressing older style, but it's chic, it's, it's fashionable. I really like it. There is one more term for that, I think. We call it retro style or something. We call it retro style. Retro there style. Yeah, 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 yeah. Retro style. Yep. That's perfectly legit. Yep. Retro style. I'll, I'll write that down. Retro style. Now, retro style, though, is, is saying old fashioned. It's saying old fashioned. You're dressing like an old fashioned style. So if I walk down the, the I don't have a bowler hat, but if I walk down the um, street uh, with a bowler hat, it would be described as retro style. Right, it's old fashioned, but it's not necessarily shabby chic, right? And in fact, you'd never describe that as shabby chic. 
But yeah. if you if you were walking down the street, Anjali, and you had a very elegant dress on, um, but it didn't look modern fashion. It looked like 1920s, or you had a hat that kind of that they used to wear in the 1920s or something, or from the 60s, a different era, right? And it didn't look brand new, right? That would be described as shabby chic. Yeah. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, especially, now this is interesting, right? So especially is a very simple word. And I don't know why I picked it, to be honest with you, because it seems very simple, but as I did, right? So especially, um, I had an ex especially good lunch today. So especially is saying something is extra special is really what, what it means, I think. Let's look it up in the dictionary together. It's funny, I've never looked up a word like especially before. He used to single out one person or thing over all others. He despised them all, especially Sylvester. Yeah, okay. To a great extent, very much. He didn't especially like dancing. All right, let's see what, let's see what Cambridge says. Oops, adverts, anyone? Very much, more than the usual, or more than other people or things. She's not especially interested in sport. So it's used positively and negatively. So she is not especially interested in sport. She's quite bookish. She likes to read all the time. I love Australian wines, especially the white ones. So that's using it in a positive sense. I, I, I really like Indian food, but not the, not the really hot ones. Yeah. Mona. Peter, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between especially that is written uh, by S and uh, this kind of especially that's written yeah. by E? Yeah. Especially. Yeah. What you're asking is the difference between especially and specially, aren't, aren't you? Yes. Have I got the question right? Right. Okay. Well, this is a specially good wine. And I think they had an almost identical example before, right? Didn't they? Especially, you know, is there anything you want to do this evening? Not specially. This is a really good question. This question, frankly, stumps me. <laughs> I used to like you, Mona. <laughs> <laughs> so what we do in a situation like this is we look it up like this, especially versus this specially. Let's read this together. The words especially and specially have just a hair's breadth of difference between them. Whoa. No wonder <laughs> I'm struggling, right? Both can be used to mean particularly especially tends to be more formal while especially tends to be more informal but our words have fine points to them that are worth worthy of being understood wow i've never thought about this before this very moment in my life here we go here's an article <laughs> the words especially have just heard the blah 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 barney frank can be ruthless in debate especially when la laying into opponents who try to evade the historical record this season as he Cosmetics is, yeah, so he said especially there. This season, SE Cosmetics is commemorating 2010 Breast Cancer Awareness Month with specially created We Can Do It Pink. Hmm. Mm -hmm. But our words have finer points to them that are worth being honest with, especially carries with it a sense of something exceptional. 
implying that there is something else that is of lesser quality. Especially, I'm reading this bit. Especially can refer to something with distinct purpose. Someone who stands apart from the rest without insinuating that there is something or especially who is less. Oh, I see. Specially trained dogs may be useful in helping to calm autistic children. Value Village's specially trained costume consultants will showcase the hottest costumes. Now that you know the finer points, you can choose the words, especially, especially, and especially carefully. Very nice. I will like that article a lot, and I will copy it into our, our dialogue. So you can go and read that in your own time. And I, I could not have articulated the difference myself before reading that, but now that I've read it, it all kind of makes sense. Especially, especially is contrasting in particular against other things that are not special. And they all come from this idea of special, right? Special, right? So we should really talk about special for a moment, right? So if something is special, it's particular. It's like, um, uh, right, so I've got a special pen here, you see? See how ornate it is? It's a special mm -hmm. pen, it's a special pen, special. You can also, a lot in Britain these days, describe a person as special. And this is often used in a pejorative sense, right? And this comes from the expression special needs. So if somebody has special needs, it means that they have some problem that needs catered for. Now it could be that they're physically disabled and they need a wheelchair access. That's a special needs person. It could be they're autistic and they sort of can function pretty much normally, um, but they have special needs. They need somebody to look after them and help them. They can't cope with life just on their own. And so if kids are in school, there's a certain category of kids that would be a very small percentage, like less than 5%, but they would be classed as special needs. And those special needs children have classroom assistance, which is an adult that helps them and gives them help. Like, right, what the teacher means, Johnny, is this. Now you do it, right? Special needs. And so that definition, that meaning has taken arms and legs. And so if we describe somebody as special, we don't mean they're special. We mean they're special needs. So it's quite a pejorative term. And I would say, I would judge that in modern 2021, 20, are we in now, that when, when somebody's described as special, it's more often than not a pejorative comment. It's, it's, it's a put down. Okay, so Mona, I still got your hand up. Have I answered your question? Have you got another question? No. You'll put, you put your hand down then. If, you, if, if you're happy, put your hand down. No. You've got another question? Uh, no, I uh, don't have any question. Thank you, teacher. Okay. I understand what you say. Great. So you, you put your hand down then so that I'm not looking to ask you another question. Then. You put your hand down. Okay. You, have to lower, okay. you have to lower it. You have to press a button to lower your hand. Yeah. Excuse me. No problem. No problem. No problem. So I am having some fun at your expense. So um, Alan is having some fun at your expense. And I can do that because we're friends, you see? So I'm having, I'm poking a wee bit of fun, saying, put your hand down, put your hand down. Uh, but I'm having some fun at your expense, right? Because it's, it's, it's you I'm doing it, but I would only do that because we're friends. I wouldn't do that with somebody I wasn't friendly to. 
So, so that's a very common expression in English, very common, having fun at someone's expense. Okay. Yeah. Right. Next one was escape. Very common word. I don't know why I picked this. I think I must have been in a mode of let's do some simple words as opposed to complicated words all the time. So escape. So um, you can escape from prison, right? It's the most obvious one, right? You get out. You know, escape is, is, is getting away from something that is holding you prisoner, right? You escape. Um, right, you can you can escape a country, right? People go and decide they're going to get out of their country, right, and and claim asylum. You could escape a situation, a difficult family situation. Um, so that's what escape means. Very very easy word, right? Dead easy. Don't need to go through that any more detail. So I'm got questions. The next word is a word that is often pronounced wrong, espresso. It's not expresso with an X, E-X, but everybody says that. Everybody says espresso. What kind of coffee would you like, Anjali? Would you like a latte or an espresso? The, the word is espresso, E-S, espresso. And I learned this a week ago, two weeks ago, uh, literally all my life, I have always said espresso because it's so similar and I just never picked up the difference. So there you go, you, you, every day is a school day. Did you know that expression? You say that a lot in Britain. Every day is a school day, which means you learn something every day. Every day is a school day. Yeah. So every day is school day. I learned today the difference between especially and specially, and I never even thought about that as a question before. Um, but I would definitely use especially more often than specially. But I would say specially in describing food. Did you like that curry you had last week? It was especially good. It was great. I would use specially without the ye in the front there. Especially good. Next word was nippy. Nippy. Now, nearly everybody in answering this got the, oh, it's cold. It's nippy out there today. Everyone seemed to get that one. But not everybody got the idea of a person being described as nippy. So like to nip somebody, you know, is to nip them, you know, like that. Like if I had a wee um, crab from the beach in my hand, it would nip me, right? It would nip with its pincers, it would nip. Now, if a person is described as nippy, it means that they speak in a way that they're nipping you you know it's like they're, they're annoying you they just really annoy you and so if i described somebody as a nippy little female that would be very pejorative term but it actually describes a reasonable proportion of people who just got far too much to say and say it very loudly and don't care what you think so that would be a nippy a nippy if i described angeli as a nippy little bism it would be really awful. Right? It wouldn't be true, but it would be a horrible thing to say. But there's lots of people that could be described as nippy little bisms. And a bism is a very pejorative term about a female. I don't know why. You could have a man who's nippy as well, but for some reason, there are more females that are nippy than men. <laughs> Just a fact. <laughs> Because a woman tends to fight with her mouth more, she speaks more, where a guy will just, he uses fists. Yeah. So a man in the same position would, would just behave differently, right? So, so that, that's a useful one to know. Um, you can say it not as strongly as that to say that, you know, the comments were quite uh, nippy. It was quite hurtful. 
I didn't enjoy those comments. It was quite nippy, you know, which means critical in a sense. So that's nippy. Then we did a shoe. I realized that the time has kind of gone. We've gone about two hours and we did not do a role play today. Uh, we've had so much fun doing vocabulary. But so what I'll do to make up for that is next time, Elham, we'll begin with a role play. All right. And then you'll still be my friend. OK. Um, I don't know where the time goes when we do these things. A shoe. A shoe is a great word. Um, so a shoe is to get rid of something, right? So to use another example that um, Andreas will know very well, there's a man in the Bible called Job, and he it says that he, in the first chapter of the book, it says he shooed evil. He was a very, very good man, and he shooed evil, right? So he was extremely upright. And, and it, it records that God said that about him. God said he shoot evil, right? He was a great, great, great man, right? He shoot evil. So to shoot something is to, you know, cast it aside. That's what to shoot means. To shoot would be a, not a common word in English. I mean, it's, it's very well understood, but, you know, you wouldn't use it that frequently. So that's a shoe and a shoot, right? Loose and lose, I mentioned deliberately because people mix these two words up. Loose and lose. So you need to understand the pronunciation of the word, first of all. Loose with two O's. Loose versus lose. So loose is like, um, I've got a wee light here, right? Um, and it has a wee thing. But I could say that it's kind of, it's kind of loose. You see, it's loose. See, it's loose. But if I was to lose it, I would like I don't know. I I didn't know where I put it. Right, I lost it, so I would lose it. So the distinguishing between those two words is lose with a Z sign, but it doesn't have a Z in it. But it sounds like a Z. Lose or loose, loose. So it's just you distinguish the two and how you pronounce the words. And they both got to do with losing some, and, and one's got to do with losing something and one has got to do with something. It's a different <coughs> meaning entirely, being loose. So if I put my watch on and, and put the strap on, I could put it on like this. Uh, but you see, it's kind of loose. It's loose. And because it's loose, if it was very loose, if it was extremely loose, especially loose, it might fall off my hand and I might lose it. I might lose it, you see, because it's really, 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 really loose. So if I went out for a run like that, I might lose it. So I'll mm -hmm. tighten it up. So that is loose and lose, right? So I want you to I want you to be able to distinguish between those two words. And then we did with nausea. Now it's interesting that nausea. It just means to make sick, right? So like that. That just means to become sick either to feel sick or to actually be sick, nausea, to vomit, right? The word nauseous or nauseous, in Britain, we say nauseous. In America, they say nauseous, same word, but they often use it metaphorically more so than in Britain. We don't, we don't say it that, but um, oh, his attitude, it really makes me nauseous means he makes me sick. Now, he doesn't really make me sick, but it's a way of expressing extreme displeasure. But I could, I could use it in a sense of like, I'm not good with long car journeys. I feel nauseous. We would say in Britain, we feel nauseous. I feel nauseous 
when I'm driving a car for a long period of time, I get car sick. I feel nauseous. The Americans would say it like this. I get nauseous, not nauseous, but nauseous. And what the Americans tend to do, as I've said, is speaking about the effect of one person on them, they don't like their attitude. It really makes me nauseous. So I said, you know, some people really didn't like Trump and he makes them feel nauseous. Yeah. I maybe shouldn't say such political statements, but I don't care. Um, that guy made me nauseous. I couldn't watch him on television. If he was on, I would turn the TV off, right? Not that I watch TV very much, but if he was on, I, I couldn't watch it, right? He would make me feel nauseous, right? So that's what nauseous means. <laughs> I'll, let's try and finish this list off. It's only got four um, other, the nauseating is, is the same family, right? That's really nauseating. So in other words, makes you sick, nauseating. And the last two are prevaricate and procrastinate. These are really good words that you have to understand. And the easy one to deal with first is procrastinate. And procrastinate is to put something off. Um, I have a homework to do, to hand, to hand in today, but I didn't do it. I, I, I'm a terrible procrastinator. Yeah, I didn't do it on time. That's to procrastinate. Right, procrastinate. Now, prevaricate does not mean that. It means something different, but it, it's often confused with it. Prevaricate is where you give an answer to a question. It's always got to do with speaking. I mean, it, it could be written, but it's nearly always to do with speaking. You get asked a question, you don't want to answer it, and so you talk around it and you don't answer. You give a, here's another nice expression, a mealy mouth response. Which is, if your mouth is full of meal, as in, oh, it's like, it's hard to speak, right? So prevaricate is where you are effectively lying but not explicitly. You're sort of talking around about it and so on. Um, um, so w when is the whole population, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, when is the whole population going to get vaccinated? Well, we're talking about that at the moment and it's a big issue, it's really important for us and we're dealing with it and we're absolutely going to do it. And, uh, you know, I didn't answer the question, but I'm talking around it like a politician. That's prevaricating. Talking around an issue, not answering it and maybe even leading you astray a little bit. So it's kind of like lying. So, the reason I say all that is, is that it's not the same as procrastinate. Lots of people say, oh, he's prevaricating when they mean procrastinating, right? You, you, it's a very important, you, you, you get those words. Used. Both these words will be common words, but the, the actual meaning of prevaricate is misunderstood. Lots of people say, I need to, uh, he's prevaricating on that issue in the sense of he's delaying the issue. They say it like they mean procrastinating, but they're using the word incorrectly. Well, guys, that's been two hours, believe it or not. Yeah. Two hours of fun learning English. So, where did the time go? And it's one o'clock in the morning for Wenjing and uh, Wee Sun. So, I apologize for keeping you so late. No, the, the, do not the, have to. The, the, these classes typically run for a couple of hours, typically. I usually try and think about finishing after an hour and a half, and it takes me another half an hour to stop. So there you go. I hope you find that fun. I'm sorry I didn't 
and get to role play, but we'll do that next time. Yeah, but it's interesting. You share the some other information like British culture or other thing. Yeah, sure. And um, I think you know each week, as you guys learn words, um, you know your vocabulary will be increasing, right? And also your listening ability will be improving because you're listening to me speaking and other classmates speaking as well. And you're also getting a little more chance to speak, not a huge amount because I know I do most of the talking. But if any of you want conversations with me, you know, you just send me a note and say, I wouldn't mind chatting to you in the next day or two and I will give you a time slot and I'll speak with you and we're gonna have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. In which case you'll be speaking for 50% of the time, right? Uh, so you can, you can practice. No problem. Just send me a note. And I can do that. Like, I'll just fit you into my life when I'm out for a drive or I'm going somewhere or whatever. I'm going to be on holiday next week. I'm away for the whole week next week in Ireland, seeing my folks. Um, so we'll have more time next week so I can speak to people next week. No problem. If you want to chat to me. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone has ideas, suggestions for improvements, other things we can, other topics, other ways of doing this, other things to learn. I'm not really following any particular protocol to teach you guys. I'm just trying to help a little bit. I hope it works. I think if you do this for a year, you'll be talking like me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Mm, hope so. All right. Well, nice to see you all. I'll bid you all good night and uh, a good evening. Good evening. Uh, buenas noches to Andres. That's my little bit of Spanish. I'm, I'm showboating my Spanish. Buenas noches. And um, I'll, I'll see you in the group, right? I'll see you in the group. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.